coming out tonight. I know the weather is not the best, right? But uh, I appreciate you coming out. We all do appreciate you coming out. We're talking about a $70 million project, and we want to make sure that everyone understands it. So before we start the slide presentation, I'd like to introduce to you the, the people that have been involved in this project since December 2019. First of all, I'd like to introduce our new superintendent, Mr. Christopher Switek, who's here with us. Uh, his assistant, Linda Lysing, who put this whole thing together. Um, very valuable part of our team. I'm Doug Whalen, now interim school business administrator. From the architect's point of view, we have Jeff Nunn and Mike Noga, both architects with Gordon Jones Associates. From the construction management, uh, campus management, we have the vice president of campus management, Nick Humphrey, and we have the senior project manager, uh, Dave Vauder, from campus management. And also from our financial uh, consultant firm, we have Jessica Bianchi, who's from RJ, RG Tim's Associates. So this team, along with Board of Education members, have been working on this capital project since 2019. And there's been probably 50 meetings. The ones that I counted up until two weeks ago, there were 40 meetings, and I know there's been meetings after that. So there's been a lot of focus on taking a look at this district and seeing what we really need in a capital project. The acronym for this capital project is SOAR. Safety, Operations, Academics, and Renovation. We're gonna to talk to you tonight about the planning process. We're gonna talk about how it's focused. We're gonna talk about the highlights of the project the potential timeline, how we're going to finance it and pay for it, and then there's a few uh, pieces of information about voting. I started off by talking about the committee. So they've been working a long time on this. The genesis of what the committee looked at is called a building condition survey. Every five years, every school district in New York State has to complete a building condition survey. It has to be performed by a professional architect and engineer, and what it does is it identifies aspects of your buildings that are gonna need fixing or repairing. And a building condition survey fits right into a capital project. These are items that cannot be put into a budget. They're very expensive things, like the bus loop at Blaisdell, like roofs, like fixing swimming pools, and doing major academic renovations that we'll talk about tonight. Those things can't fit in a 2% increase in a budget. So the state has put this process together called a capital project where, you know, we talk about state aid, and I well know by talking to people that the state is us. So when we talk about it's state funded, you know, government really doesn't have any money. It's all coming from us, right? But these are things we need to do and if we don't do capital projects to improve our facilities, and we have $198 million worth of assets here, if we don't improve them, this money goes to someone else. So it's at the right time that this district needs to look at a capital project. We looked at instructional initiatives, and we'll talk about that. Also, anything with a capital project starts with wants, and then what do you really need? So hopefully we're gonna take this $70 million, which is a large number, and we, under, you know, we understand this is a large number, but remember it's over five years. And when you're trying to predict costs over five years, there are certain escalators in here. So it is a lot of money, we're trying to break it down, hopefully get everyone to understand it. So the main areas of SOAR, there's an awful lot of safety built into this project. Safe and secure entrances, what is that? Our buildings are safe, they're electronically locked after the students get in. But what happens when people approach the building after the children are in and they wanna come in to do this or they wanna deliver this? What has to happen is these people, individuals, have to come into a safe and secure contained area. 
so that we can assess what they want and then we can allow them in the building. So every one of our buildings is going to get this safe and secure entrance. Big Tree is the only one right now that comes close to that, where people come into a contained area. The public address system and alarm systems at Pinehurst are on their last legs. So that is the one that needs to be fixed. Pedestrian and car traffic, that's a Blaisdell issue. That's the major bus loop we'll talk about. Playgrounds, the equipment looks new, but it's really old. We can't get replacements, and it's actually the surface that is not safe and takes an awful lot of maintenance. So when you have wood chips or cinders or anything like that, there's a lot of accidents involved. So we have an opportunity to make the surface safe as well as put age-appropriate equipment in there. There is some asbestos abatement. It's all in the floor tile. So when we're doing renovations to classrooms and hallways, there'll be some of that. Operations. The boilers in this building, there are three boilers. It's a hot water system. They are old. They are very inefficient. They're going to be replaced. There's mechanical electrical systems. There's some office improvements. Academics. An awful lot of money in here for academics. STEAM is science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. And that is the new way that we're teaching children in the old industrial arts area. So technology and the arts and the engineering coming together, this is what children need today to be competitive. Physical education spaces, there's gymnasiums that the ceilings have to come out, the lighting has to be changed, there needs to be more soundproofing. Um, flexible instructional spaces, we're renovating every instructional space over at Pinehurst. It's a building that has not had any capital improvements uh, in many, many years. So some of the classrooms are going to be made into more flexible instructional spaces. Classroom improvements include ceiling, lights, painting, things of that nature, taking out the asbestos floor tile. Renovations. There's a lot of roof area in this building. There's roof in the high school over the foreign language wing. So there are roof replacements, restrooms. At Pinehurst, every restroom is going to be renovated. The restrooms in the lobby of the upper high school auditorium, if anyone's been up there, they are original, they need to be fixed, right? So I think we can agree on that. As we go through these things, these are things the committee has looked at and said, you know, it's about time we, we, we get on these things. Kitchens and cafeterias, I just want to mention a couple more. The kitchen at the high school is going to be totally redone. The kitchen at the middle school, totally redone. At the elementaries, there's serving lines, and we'll, we'll look at that. Pool replacement, our middle school pool has not been filled in two years. It has a major structural crack in it. It was a, a lot of money to fix it, so there was a lot of discussion on what to do with that. It's been decided to make it into another instructional space for the physical education department. I talked about lobbies and locker rooms, middle school, Pinehurst, high school. These, all these locker rooms are original and need to be totally updated. What is a blue light system? It's going into all of our buildings. It's an emergency notification system where after the school is locked, and let's say something happens. There'll be a panic button located probably with the principal or in other areas where there'll be a blue flashing light so that students that are in the gyms, in the pools, wherever they are where there's maybe a lot of noise and they don't, can't hear the announcements, whenever they see this blue light, they will know and the teachers will know there's a problem in the building. Secured entrances we talked about. Pinehurst. This is everything that's happening. Uh, we talked about the floors, we talked about the ceilings, the abatement. Every classroom is getting redone. All the lights, all the cabinets, all the whiteboards, everything's going to be painted. All the toilet areas are going to be redone. It is getting a new playground, secured entry system, and the blue light system. This shows Pinehurst from a total perspective. The classrooms in green 
are non-asbestos floors, but those classrooms are going to be renovated. The classrooms in blue have asbestos tile on the floor. The two areas in the front of the building are the art and the music um, classrooms. Those are going to be done. The green at, by the gym, that's the locker room. That's going to be totally redone. The dark blue areas by the, in the hallways, those are the uh, large lavatories. You might look at the, the blue classrooms going up and say, where are the lavatories there? They're in each classroom. So when they built the new wings, they put these gang uh, lavatories in. That, that's the scope of the whole project. It's going to be done in phases, phase one and phase four. And the reason for this is there's something called a maximum cost allowance. And that, you need that to generate the maximum state aid. And we are at Pinehurst, we are at the threshold of our maximum cost allowance for state aid. So this has to be done in two different phases. The maximum cost allowance, um, What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, every five years, it updates. So uh, you need to have a five-year passage of time before you can go back to your next maximum cost allowance. So that's why Pinehurst is done in two phases, and they're five years apart. This is Pinehurst from phase four, which is the last part of the project. It just shows you the areas that are going to be done. The rest of the classrooms, the art, the music room, the locker rooms, and some of the classrooms on the, the wing here in the front. At Big Tree, we're replacing the serving line because it's old. It looks new, but a lot of the components are old. They need to be fixed. They need to be replaced. There's some asbestos, uh, asbestos abatement. They're getting a new digital sign, new playground, blue light system. Cloverbank, same thing. Uh, replacing the serving line, there's some asbestos. Cloverbank is the newest playground, so we're just going to expand that, and we're going to change the surface. Some of you may have seen these new surfaces on these playgrounds. They're very spongy and soft, and very, very good, very appropriate. And remember, the, these are things for the community as well. So when you have these playgrounds, the community can use them as well. Blue light system. Blaisdell. We're going to show you this large bus loop. We do need to separate the car traffic from the bus traffic. The Department of Transportation totally controls how the, we're going to talk to you about one entrance in. It's totally controlled by them. We haven't finished the discussion with them because we think there needs to be another exit out. And when we get to that diagram, I'll talk to you about a couple of things we're thinking about. But the serving line, some asbestos, brand new playground because uh, the playground is now located where the bus loop is going. We'll show you that. And the blue light system. So this is a picture of the new bus loop. You can see where the new playground is going in the upper right. The playground is actually right where it says 39 car parking spaces. That's where it's located now, but it's old. It needs to go. It needs to be replaced. The entrance now is that uh, dark green area uh, where there were, well, it's the dark green area on the left. That's the way in. But the Department of Transportation is asking us and actually requiring us to have one way in, and that's at the traffic light. When we looked at this, we still want to talk to them because we think in case of an emergency, there may need to be like a gate near that dark green area where, where cars or emergency vehicles can get out. They may have to go over the grass, but we need to have, I think, and maybe the architects can talk about that, there needs to be another way out in case of an emergency. These are conceptual um, diagrams of what a playground would look like. It is not the diagram of the playground as to what it's going to be. The principals have to be involved. The children are going to be involved. But it gives you an idea. We're talking about safe surfaces. We're talking about age-appropriate equipment. And we're talking about themes. So we, we would like the children to 
decide on what type of theme they want for their, for their playground. This is another conceptual drawing. Um, it may look totally different from this, but it is going to be a flat surface. It may have different equipment, etc. The middle school. First of all, a lot of dollars into the academic part with this steam. The conversion of the pool. This is how the pool looks today. It hasn't been filled in a couple years. The committee that's looked at this and talked about this has decided that this would be another instructional space for the physical education department. So that pool right now is planned to be filled in and a wood floor put over it. The gymnasiums, the locker rooms are going to totally be renovated. The gymnasiums, the ceilings are going to come out. There'll be more, uh, there'll be painting. Uh, there'll be more sound absorption material put on the walls. The lighting will change in the gymnasiums. And there's a small gym and there's a large gym. The cafeteria, kitchen area, is totally going to be changed, totally renovated. All new equipment, a different type of layout, totally. Uh, new modern layout. The eating area is fine. Uh, that's been renovated in the past. The boilers, as I said, three boilers need to be replaced. The roof above technology, auditorium, gym, locker room, and pool, that's a long area. They're all adjacent to one another. That's going to be replaced. This area is going to be made into the secure entry. So it hasn't been designed yet, but you may see those stairways come out, and you may see a single stairway to open it up. You may see the side wall opened up into an office area where they can see who's coming in. So that's where the secure entrance is going to be, and the blue light system. So this gives you an idea of the total middle school, um, what's going to happen. In the back is your cafeteria, the front of the building. This is your, your whole steam and technology in the far left. All of this is going to be taken apart. All of this here is new, whoops, hit the wrong. All of this here is new roofing. So locker rooms, gymnasium, auxiliary gym, all the roofing above the uh, technology area. It's all new roofing. Here's the secured entrance down in the front. And this is your kitchen area. The high school. Once again, the whole back of the high school is going to be taken apart. All the uh, older industrial arts areas is going to be made into modern steam suite. Gyms are the same thing. The gym, the ceiling's coming out, the lights are coming out, um, painting, that type of thing. Pool renovation. We're not doing anything with the basic design. What's going to happen is all new tile work. All new tile work, and maybe the entrance coming in might be different, but the pool is going to look exactly like it is. All of the filtration equipment and everything underneath the pool is all going to be changed. This was a 1959 building, uh, so it's original stuff. Now we talk about the baseball field, the brand new varsity baseball field, synth synthetic turf, and the multi-purpose field, which would be girls softball. Uh, it's going to be soccer. It's going to be lacrosse, and we'll show you a picture of that. The high school, we talked about the auditorium lobbies. Um, it's a tight area. We really wanted to make the lobby bigger, but um, did not have the resources for that. And frankly, it would have cost a lot of money. So what we're going to do is make renovations there. We're going to take some walls down that border the uh, stairways going upstairs, open it up a little bit. Up in the upper lobby area, the lavatories I mentioned, needs to be painted, needs to be different floor tile talked about, well, the foreign language, uh, we'll show you the foreign language wing, it needs a new roof. The secured entry system is going to be, if any of you are familiar with the high school, you walk right in the front doors and you're right there in the hallway. So that whole area is going to be renovated. And the blue light system. So this gives you a pictorial of the entire building. You can see the upper, upper um, lobby of the auditorium. You can see the gym. And uh, going back, 
You can see this whole area here is the technology that's going to change. There's a couple new art rooms. There's the whole cafeteria is going to change. The layout is not right. The kitchen is not right. It has all these different small little rooms. We had rooms for teacher dining room. We had a, we had a senior lounge there. Uh, walls have to come down. It has to be opened up. It's going to be a beautiful area. So you see the, the uh, lobby there, um, the renovations. The old library. Oh, I must have hit something. The old library is going to totally be changed into a better instructional space. It's an awful uh, large room, but it can be really, really put into uh, good use. It, we use it now, but I mean, it's such a large space and um, such a great space to change into a better academic area. The bottom uh, part of the diagram is the foreign language wing. That's where the roofing is going to happen. And we can go ahead on the next slide. OK, so this is, in concept, what the new varsity baseball diamond is going to look like and what the new multi-purpose uh, girls softball, uh, lacrosse, and soccer is going to look like. They may not be oriented this way. These are just diagrams. So all of that has to be looked at because you may ask, why is baseball going one way and softball going another way? But right now, it's just we're laying this out, and we have cost estimates on it, but we're showing it to you as a concept. These fields are going to be also lit, so there's going to be lighting at night. What a great area this is going to be, not only for our school, but for the community. You can get on these fields sooner. You can have much, uh, much more activity on them, much more kids enjoy them. That large space with the girls' softball can also be used for physical education. So it's going to be quite a complex. Here's the phases. So phase one is elementary schools. We talked about that. It's also the high school varsity baseball field and the multipurpose field. So phase two is the middle school. Phase three is the high school. And phase four is coming back five years later and finishing up Pinehurst. I know that's a long time, but I have my little cheat sheet on the side here. The referendum is July 20th. The design phase is going to take five months. So if this is passed, it'll be December when the design is done. The has to be sent to the State Education Department for review that takes 12 weeks, so we'll be into the end of March. The bidding and award takes about a month, so that's March, April. And then we'll have shovels in the ground May or June of 2022. So we expect to have this baseball field done, a lot of uh, the playgrounds done, a part of Pinehurst done, um, all of that stuff is going to be done in the first phase. How is this going to be financed? The number's large. It's $70 million. But if you look at what we're trying to do, all the academic renovations, there's a lot of money when you start taking the walls down and, and changing things around. There's a lot of money in that bus loop. But the important thing that we want to try to show here is 10% of it is paid by the taxpayers. 67% is coming from state aid, and I know that's us, right? That's the government, but it's us. 18%, um, what that represents is there's debt going away. When you have a capital project, you have a principal and interest payment for 20 years. So there's 18% debt going away, and there's 18% debt coming in. So in terms of a budget, it's a wash. And that's how you want to plan a capital project. The capital reserve is money that the district has that it has saved for capital projects or minor renovations. So the district has, we're putting in 5% money into this. Uh, we're totally liquidating our 2016 capital reserve, which is $2 million. We're totally, we're going into our 2019 capital reserve, 
$300,000, and out of district balances, another $2 million. So we're funding this capital project to the tune of $5 million. So out of the $70 million, we're, we're putting in, from money we've saved, $5 million. There's no, I just want to show you that tax. There's no tax impact for the first three years. However, there is going to be a tax impact in the remaining three years. So that you need to understand. And uh, please ask us questions about that. You know, how does it relate to my tax bill? How much is it going to go up? Because that's very important for people to understand. This is information that we have. There's fact sheets available. Everyone got a newsletter. This is the first public information meeting. There's one Thursday night. Everything's on our district website, and we're really encouraging the public to come out and exercise their right to vote on the 20th. There is a QR code here. This one is not active on the sheets, but when you go to vote, there will be a QR code, and you just use that code and you'll be taking an exit poll survey. So we'll have someone there showing you how to do that. Um, but basically, it'll be for people like me that need instruction, right? <laughs> you take a picture with your phone and just fill out the survey. So we'd like to open it up now for any questions that you may have. Anything we've talked about, please. And come on down and let's talk about this whole project together. Ma'am, can you come down because we're recording this and we want to get that question on for the community. But we'll bring the mic to you. Okay, can you guys hear me? Everybody good? Okay, so currently we're accounting for three new playgrounds, right? And then one expansion with surface replacement. Um, was there any consideration given to making them handicap accessible? I see in the images that there are images of handicap accessible playground equipment, but you said that that wasn't necessarily going to be the equipment. So are we accommodating kids with special needs? Has that been considered? Yeah, I, I can talk to that specifically. Um, we are working with a group called Parkitects. Um, that's the reason, actually, that we're putting in that rubber surface, so okay. that the entire playground would be accessible to every student. And there are certain pieces that are going to be totally inclusive to, to anyone who may have any disability. It's okay. not just kids in wheelchairs. There's kids with different different um, disabilities that you know we're going to be working with. So that'll all be developed with each one of the, the schools too. Um, so we've got some groups that we're going to pull together. Hopefully, once this passes, and okay. um, but yes, everything will be inclusive when we're done. Okay. So wheelchair accessibility, Absolutely. sensory integration, all of that. Yeah, and okay. that's and that's that surfacing that's so important because right. the wood chips don't allow for that or it excludes certain areas of the right, playground. Mobility, right. right, so this would include everyone. Okay, um, and then my follow-up question was the STEM versus the STEAM curriculum. Is the STEAM currently being implemented or is it currently just STEM curriculum? Like a STEM overall? So the difference is bringing in the arts. Uh, the arts, right, correct. The, I think to the greatest extent we okay. have STEM right now, and I wouldn't be surprised if I did not remember uh, with the curriculum per se, but I think that they're moving in that direction. And okay. we have a tremendous art department. Right. I no, I, I agree that the arts are very important. Um, it's just I do not want to see, like there's a objective and a subjective kind of thing going on here, but transparency in the curriculum, like will that be available to us as residents and everything like will we see the outline of the curriculum so that we know and understand yes, everything yes, obviously yes. we're looking for like, yes, what we'll be teaching, how we're those right okay. I think that was it thank you I appreciate it thank you
Hello everyone, I'm Allie Gates. Um, I was a graduate of Frontier High School in 2016. I played girls varsity and JV lacrosse um, all four years. I also was in the musicals as well. So I just wanted to say thank you to all of the implements and everything that you guys have all made. Um, as a graduate, it's awesome seeing all these things and I wish that I was going to school when all these things were coming because it's just great. Um, I did have a question though. Um, a little background story, my senior year, um, I sparked interest in a Title IX acquisition, I guess you could say, um, Mr. Gray, Mr. Sorticio, a former principal, and Dr. Apthorpe, a former superintendent, actually was in on this petition that I created. Um, there was three boys' locker rooms, or team rooms, I should say, not locker rooms, um, JV and varsity, boys, um, lacrosse, baseball, and say track all had their own team rooms. And the girls, varsity, softball, lacrosse, and track had to share one large team room, which I believe is now being changed into the art rooms, which I'm a fan of fine arts and music, obviously, if I did the musicals, so I'm not against that by any means. Um, but in regards to Title IX, in the past I brought this up because I felt it was unequal between us and the boys' teams. I would come into varsity lacrosse practice and um, before it changed before, and you'd have to step over the softball bags to get to the varsity girls' lacrosse um, lockers. Or the varsity softball team, they had a girl coach, so then they would have team room or team meetings in the team room while we were trying to get changed or we were trying to get ready for a game. So um, in many different ways, that was unequal. The female coaches only had one room for them to be able to go into, and it ended up just being a storage room. And the male coaches had three different rooms per each team room um, to go into for their space. So um, without seeing the girls' team room in the project, I was wondering if we had any ideas, any rooms of where we were planning on putting this. Um, I wouldn't want to see it go from unequal to completely unfair. Um, I'm obviously gung-ho for women's sports, and I think that we all deserve equal rights in any way, shape, or form. Um, so I was just wondering what the thoughts were about this. Yeah, I mean, go, go ahead, but I mean, we, we're still in the pro uh, Maybe you could pull the high school plan up, John, is that possible? Almost. First floor. There you go. So we're still in the process of developing it, and once the project passes, we would we would further look into where things are going to position themselves. Mm -hmm. But the the overall idea was to bring art over to the steam area. What it, you're absolutely right. What it did is it displaced the girls' locker room, and you're absolutely right. There's three boys' locker room, boys' team rooms to the left of where the existing pool is. You'll see two of them there, and then one on the top. So the idea was that perhaps one of those three gets taken back over for girls, mm -hmm. and then we develop a girls' locker room in one of those, what we currently have as athletic storage spaces. So there would be a new girls' locker room created in that new technology steam area on the other side of the, the gym. But when we were all said and done, the intent was that we were going to equalize mm -hmm. what you experienced as yeah. a student here about four years ago, right. Okay. So, so two two for girls, two, and then a coaches in each for the girls, correct? Yeah, we're, we're, we're to, we would find a way to okay. kind of yeah. equalize that when we're all said and done, but we're still mm -hmm. in the process of, um, you know, meeting with the staff here and determining how mm -hmm. that's all going to work out. And I may be speaking for myself, but I just, I wanted to make sure, I mean, I know that everything can't be finalized. You guys said that you guys will be discussing more about the plans in the future, but for me, I've been waiting five years to have anything be done about this, and um, I even toured the locker rooms. I was, I had a meeting with the superintendent. Um, unfortunately, I went to college. I was in physician assistant school, so I've been busy the past couple of years, so I couldn't have been hounding people, but now I'm here. Um, but I just want to make sure before I vote yes to this that it's not going to be subsided and not going to be forgotten about. Um, so if there's any way even I can get in on meetings, because I'm going to be done with school in two weeks, so even if I can give my two cents in, or I have a lot of friends and a lot of former players that I know from softball, track, lacrosse, all of the above, um, that I would like even for input from them, 
if you'd be willing, I would more than likely be able to send something to you guys. And this is what I can share with you uh, as superintendent of Frontier and also the father of three NCAA girls, yes. athletes. I think you probably played against some of them. When did I you graduate? I graduated, oh, in 2016. You so maybe, yeah, you yeah. probably played against some of them. Mm -hmm. The girls will be equally represented at Frontier Central School. I give you my word on that one. Thank you, I'm happy to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a frontier athlete from back in the 70s. Thank you. I am. Um, at looking at the athletic fields, I was a softball player. We never had the best of fields. I'm insulted that we have to share it as a soccer field. I think softball, baseball, varsity has their own field. I don't see why not the girls varsity don't have their own field. That's the way I feel. We have another turf that's made for the soccer teams. Why aren't they on the football field? It's not just a football field. I just feel those both of them should be their own field. I don't see a reason why we have to share it. If the varsity boys don't, the varsity girls should not have to either, especially since we already have a, a football field that's turfed and all done and was uh, edged out for soccer, I believe, too, that there should not be another soccer field like that if the girls can't have their own field. It should be not the, you know, two and one. And jumping on what, what Ellie said, I think you ought to let people know, because there's a lot of female athletes in the area. From way back when I graduated, their kids have gone through, grandkids are coming through now, that you might want to let them know that there are girls' team rooms looking up, because we never had them. Um, Mr. Gray helped her get the big one. Uh, so I would hope that you would advertise it a little more, because talking to people, and I'll be honest, I said, hey, I'm going to a meeting, because there's no girl team room. So, and a lot of people that I know are like, okay, let us know because we'll turn it down if we, the girls don't get equal. So I think it's important that you let out there because you've got the, the males, but you don't have the, the girls identified at all. Uh, hello everyone, my name is David Rousseau. I graduated from Frontier in 2007. And like Allie, when I was younger, I did the same type of advocacy for Frontier. And to your point, I think that this is probably the biggest insult to the reputation in the athletic program that this man built. I watched him take over from a previous athletic director and turn Frontier Athletics around, just wanting everyone to have an opportunity to play. And so to see that so much sharing is going on on one field and that, you know, the girls, again, I, and I went to school in the early 2000s and saw that this was a, a disparity, and I know that there's logistics, um, but I sure hope you can do better, and I know you will. One thing that was said, though, was that I heard once the project passes, how can you convince Allie and myself to vote for this? I plan on starting a family in this district. How do you convince us to vote if we don't even know what we're voting on? I have to vote and then you'll show me what I'm getting. That seems a bit, a bit of a problem. So my first question as someone who swam varsity and modified is with the middle school pool. Uh, you did cover some of it, but um, why are we eliminating this? I don't understand, I, I understand that there's financial constraints, but I called around the past week. I actually heard about this at a, uh, at a March board meeting. I started making some phone calls. This would make this the only middle school in Erie County in the suburbs that doesn't have a pool. I find this to be ironic seeing as we border one of the five Great Lakes. A lot of swim programs took place here. I learned how to ride a canoe in my phys ed class here. I learned how to swim. I swam modified. I swam varsity. Um, I'd go on and teach learn to swim programs here at the, swim, at the pool through both the Town of Hamburg Partnership and uh, Frontier Central and then become a lifeguard and lifeguard for state parks and for the town of Hamburg as I worked my way through UB. So why, why haven't we been a little more creative with funding? That's my first question. Why haven't we been more creative to ensure that there could be a pool here? That's a big selling point to get districts, you know, get families in the district. So we'll start with that. Why, why are we just eliminating the pool? It's a conceptual idea, correct, yeah. 
So I'll try and take the lead on that. All right. Um, so the concept of, of the elimination of the pool is just one idea to maximize the space and maximize state aid in regards to the use of that facility. Um, I happen to agree with you with the, with the use of the pool, the community input on the pool, and the value of the pool. And, and thank you for doing your research because that would leave Frontier as one of maybe the only only one so in my house shopping it's made me actually consider hamburg and that's saying something because i graduated from this district because i know that they not only have both pools but are renovating them to make them better yeah i actually worked in hamburg so i'm familiar with okay. Hamburg very well so um i am familiar with it so um thank you very much for your input and candidly um the softball concept uh the single use softball concept and the single use pool for the middle school are two areas that the district will continue to explore with the architects and the construction manager and do a cost uh, and estimation on both of them. Um, very valid points. Um, in addition, we had walked through the facility with this entire team, I wanna say three or four days ago, and our football field is lined for those other multi-use sports, okay? So that was questions that this entire team has asked itself as well, um, and we'll do some balancing structures in regards to funds, fund availability, and how the state aid gets balanced in the use for both of those facilities. So I would like to say thank you for your input. You bring up a very valid point, um, and both of those facilities will be analyzed very clearly. Okay. So does that what is the what's the plan? Let's say the pool does get filled in. What's the plan for swim education for a modified swim program, which would go back to Title IX? When I swam modified, I think there were three, maybe four guys on the team, and the rest were females getting ready to go to varsity, and it bridged that gap. What would be the plan for those programs if the pool does get filled in? Would the district just stop offering modified swim, or actually, Mr. Gray, can you help me out with the plan for modified? At the evening at the high school? Yes. Okay. Well, I was someone who, and Rich knows this, I used to be Mr. Gray, and now he's rich because I, I referee soccer in the community for Frontier, and I played varsity soccer, played varsity tennis as a middle schooler. So the logistics in, in that can be tricky, but it, it's tough, but if you want to do it, you do it. I'm not saying it's okay, but if this is what it, if it comes down to dollars and cents, as long as that program doesn't disappear, it might be a little more palatable, not completely, but because I'd still, again, the phys ed, Dave Procknell had us in that canoe flipping it and then had us getting it back in. So uh, very important to me um, because this, I see this leading to an increase in drownings in the community and it could just be a problem. So now we go to my major. I'm a chemical and biological engineer by trade and I've studied extensively synthetic turf fields. So my first question is, what is the cost to purchase the material that will be used for the synthetic surfaces? Give me one second, please. It's about a million dollars in round numbers. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yep, okay. so we have said a million. What is the cost to maintain per year? So that's actually a very good question that's asked a lot in a lot of districts. So if you kind of think about what the maintenance staff does now as far as mowing the grass, taking care of the grass, they don't have to do that anymore. Um, there is a process though where they actually go out um, periodically to maintain and groom the field. So most districts that were actually doing this, they find that it, from a facility standpoint, it's actually a time saver as far as, a, you know, as, far as the maintaining of the field. Um, and then ultimately allows you as the, as the community to utilize it more, especially as we live in Western New York, we all know, and I have you know, baseball and softball kids at home that usually it's, it's tough and even soccer you know, in Western New York, so. So unfortunately, we live in a district that got uh, pigeonholed into a financial gap with the way New York State does funding. For the longest time, Frontier was really trying to provide value added dollar to their families. And in doing so, they are now, they now have trouble getting state aid because of the way the state aid is set up. And so what I see with districts who find themselves in this position is that the turf field doesn't become a time and a cost saver from the maintenance standpoint, 
but it becomes neglected. And I point to Buffalo Public Schools all high and Nichols, who, you know, kids pay 30, 40,000. If you look at those turf fields, they went from maintaining them to reallocating those funds to maintain them and put them into other programs. And now it's so neglected, it's a carpet and it's leased out to the, you know, the men's soccer team, uh, the men's soccer league in the summer beats it up. Communities come in and play lacrosse on it and they beat it up. And it gets so neglected that eventually it becomes a carpet and it's no longer safe. Which brings me to my next point. What is the underlayment on the turf surface going to be? I know University of Tennessee at Knoxville has been doing a study on different underlayments uh, with the goal of minimizing ACL-induced injuries in youth athletes. Um, they are found to be significantly higher on natural turf, turf surfaces due to the recoil back to the joint versus the normal uh, compression and absorption that a natural playing surface such as grass or dirt would provide. So what is that underlayment going to be? Yeah, we, we can kind of speak to the composition of the field. It's it's the same as all of the other local schools are putting in. Basically. Well, so they're all different. Actually, Eden has a proper underlayment where Will North went with the rubberized underlayment. So there's, so, yeah, so there's, there's a couple different schools of thoughts and there's a couple different systems that you can buy. But it's a stone sub base that takes all of the water and, and runs that through your storm collection system. And then on top of that, the district has an option to go with a rubber pad or to not have a rubber pad. And then it's a sand and rubber infill that infills that two and a half inches, two and a half, two and a quarter inches of carpet. Okay. And then there's actually, before we actually turn over the field, there's actually a GMAX test that has to be performed to make sure that that actually fits within the parameters that are outlined for play. Okay. And that would get tested and maintained Correct. by the district as you go along. We, we just took out our first field that we installed uh, locally in 2000, Medina's field. That was one of the first ones that we put in in Western New York. We were able to get the whole 15 years out of that field before it ended up needing replacement. But it, they neglected it for years too, just because in the beginning, nobody knew what to do. You know, everybody thought you were buying a field with no maintenance. Well, there is maintenance. Right, you have to repel it, you have to fluff right, it. Right, as long as it's scheduled and followed, you can definitely um, you know, get your 15 years out of it. So is that, and that was gonna be my next question, the lifespan that we're going for with this turf surface, is it going to be about 15 years? Is it gonna be yes. the 25 year, 10 year? Yeah, You're going for the 15, 15 years? Yeah. Okay. Um, these surfaces are rubber. They're made of plastics and rubber and things that aren't really highly recyclable. What's going to be to ensure that it is recyclable or has a decent end of life when it's done and it is ripped out that it doesn't just wind up in a landfill? So we've, we've worked with different fields where they reclaim that rubber and then they basically distribute, they'll, they'll, um, they'll take it, they'll clean it, they'll sell it to another process, they'll use it in another field somewhere else, but those things are collected at the end. So they'll actually come out with, um, it's almost like a big vacuum basically, and it, they'll remove all the material from the field and that'll be taken away. This, the great thing is, is that that stone subbase though gets reused. Right. And that rubber padding, that half inch rubber padding can be reused. And then it's basically just the carpet and then the reinstallation of that infill the second time that it needs to get replaced. And what type of reimbursement would the district receive for recycling it or selling it off to a type of process? Is that cost been analyzed? So it's actually, to just to finish the, the last thought, is you'll find that we have fields to, to the architect's point as well that we put back in early 2000s. And with proper maintenance and everything, they're still, they're still doing great. But we have taken removed fields. And to your point, as far as recyclable and stuff, majority of the fields that actually get removed the turf is actually, I've seen a lot of different things with different districts, but they can sell it, they can turn it over, they can donate it. If you go to a lot of local, um, for instance, batting cages around and such, that turf is actually from fields that have been removed elsewhere in the communities and across the country. So it's not just going to landfills, it actually gets repurposed. Okay, yep, and I know that the Bills turf wound up at Mulroy Field. There so you go, yep. I know it can be repurposed, I just wanna make sure there's a plan in place to repurpose it should it come to that. Um, Off-gassing, these things off-gas for 18 months to two years. What type of plan is in place to mitigate those fumes and protect students and the surrounding community? I haven't From heard of that being an issue, off-gassing of the carpet. I mean, we're putting these fields in and they're being played on immediately. And right. that's the beauty of them. I mean, they'll, they'll get played on more than your fields do now. So 
the, the great thing about this multi-purpose field too is you know, the, the elementary school kids can go over there and play a gym where perhaps it was muddy before or you know, you're just going to get a lot more use out of them. But that's my concern, right, is I have an elementary stu school student playing on something that's undergone vulcanization and plastization with polyethylene or polybutyl acetate and it's uh, off-gassing, and they're inhaling these things. What, so I mean, these are known carcinogens. Right, there's different, and there's different types of rubber surfacing. There's different types of rubber that you can put into these fields. So there's the SBR rubber, which is kind of like the recycled car type. Yep. There's the EPDM rubber, which is a more virgin type mm -hmm. of rubber. So we'll, we'll have discussions with the district as to what type of rubber uh, we feel is best. I mean, but all of the rubbers that are out there have been exclusively tested. I mean, you could you could go back to some of the reports. Um, certainly, the government's looked at them. They've been evaluated in Europe as well. Um, I have kids, little kids too, that play on these fields in different sports, and I'm I feel that it's safe enough as a parent to let my kids, you know, right. go on them and roll around and you know dump their sneakers full of rubber back out when they're done. But like I said, I, my, my degree from school is chemical and biological engineering, so I've studied these things, so I know no matter what rubber you put in, there's off-gassing, and those fumes are toxic and hazardous, at least for the initial time peak. So I would like to ask the district, if you can't answer me straight now, that you at least consider something with that, because these fumes are harmful. And there was actually reports of students passing out when they were exercising on these fields within the first few months. Uh, the community, of course, complaining, especially in schools where the neighborhoods surround them, computing of, of the noxious fumes, especially on a hot summer day when you could see the fumes off-gassing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm going to throw that out there, and I know that people who are watching this will see that, but um, I'm not really satisfied with different types of rubber because that's my major. That's what I went to mm -hmm. school, and that's what I've been practicing since 2012. So, um, you know, with all due respect, uh, that's something that needs to be addressed. Um, and then finally, the lighting. You mentioned the lighting. What type of lighting will be going in to ensure that it's low light emission, such as those found at the flash fields that were just installed in Elma or Eden Central High School? So they're actually going to be LED lights, very similar to um, Eden's field was one of the newest LED lights that are out there. Um, they're now even, those are outdated, believe it or not, we actually did that field. Um, so every year they continue, just like every anything, to continue to make them more efficient and um, there's actually a um, they actually design it so there's no off lighting off you know spillage they call it light spillage You're right so like for instance in the Williamsville's and such very tight communities these lights now are all very easily programmable so there's no light spillage and etc on the outside okay did that answer yeah. your question yep I mean you could look at Medina as well it's their field is literally right in the heart of their community so they have neighbors that directly backyards and pools and everything are right up to the fence of right. the school. They had the same concern. We were able to take light levels before we put the new lights in and with the old lights and light levels after and they were reduced. We have that much of an ability to control that light now. Awesome. Okay. Um, could you explain the balloon jump on the taxes? I see we go three years without a tax increase and then it jumps up to a pretty hard hit. And this is just for this project. It doesn't take into account any tax increases that are occurring due to the curriculum component, which most families in this district overwhelmingly approve because of the strong art program, because of the strong athletics, because of the strong science and technology. Um, this is a big jump for just a project component. Why would we not spread this out knowing that there's also going to be tax increases due to the project, or due to, sorry, due to the program component of school funding? Um, so basically, the reason why we've worked it in this way, the first few years, the district is paying the same level on their existing debt on all the prior projects. So starting in 2025, there's a drop in the local share of existing debt. So we start bringing this new debt in. Unfortunately, there's rules as far as bonding money and when you have to make payments. So we're not able to spread it out any further than that. So that's why there's a jump in 25. We go up a little bit more in 26, and then 27 is the final increase for the project, and then after that, it's gonna start actually dropping down from that high point level. And at that point, obviously, we could look at if there's any other projects that need to be done or anything like that, but there's legal requirements once you borrow money. You have to make a principal payment back on the bond within two years, so that, that unfortunately is why we can't 
spread that out like another 10 years of the impact? Well, not even spreading it out that way, but why can't it be spread inward to minimize the hit in 2025? Uh, 2025? Why wouldn't you start increasing the taxes in 2022-2023? Um, I think I'd, we could look at that, but what, how that was structured was at that point in time, you're still paying on all of the existing debt, so we were trying to bring in the debt where we had the maximum impact, where there's a drop in the existing local share, to level out some of that impact. I think that if we brought it in sooner, you're actually going to end up seeing more of a spike in those early years because you're still paying the high level on your existing debt at that point in time. Yeah, my, my fear is that that number plus combined with whatever will be included in the, in the almost guaranteed uh, you know, instruction component, uh, program component of taxes, that's going to cause people to vote no on a school board budget vote and cause program. I mean, I was around in school when red budget, green budget happened under Giambra. And I remember the cuts that happened when the, di when the district didn't pass. Um, and so I fear that that number is going to cause that. And I'm not a fortune teller, but if history repeats itself, the larger the number, the more likely this district will say no. So just something I would like to bring to the floor right. and attention. And, you know, there was also phasing that we took into consideration. Like we talked about Pinehurst being done five years later. So we were looking at the same type of thing for the work at the high school. Unfortunately, in order to provide the equity of girls and boys sports, we need to move both of the fields up into phase one, and there's just not the maximum cost allowance there to support both fields, but I think that we all felt that we needed to provide that equity to boys and girls sports and get both fields done at the same time. So that's another reason why we had to shift that up in the project timeline so that we weren't doing the boys field in phase one and the girls field five years later. Okay. Um. Why the push for LED signs out front in the district, especially at our elementary schools? Just a curiosity question. Um, I can see putting one outside the high school. I can see putting one outside the middle school. Um, I grew up where it was just a backlit sign and you went and pushed up the little plastic num letters and numbers and it advertised that way. So why the push for the LED signage? I can share it with you. This is my sixth day here, so I don't know that. But if, you, if I get a chance to speak with you after this, I'll get your number and I'll give you the answer to that. Awesome. Okay. And I guess where that question ties in to my final question that I have for you tonight, and I appreciate you giving me this opportunity, why are we having these meetings a week before the referendum if we have all these LED signs currently in the district? Why wasn't this advertised on those sign boards? Why wasn't this meeting a week or so before? It is on the sign boards. I'm, I mean, I saw a sign when I walked in, but I didn't see anything advertised on the district's LED signage outside of their schools for the meetings. So. Yeah, it's on every single board. Okay. And it's been in the newspapers. Um, there's a legal component yep. that you have to yeah. put in the newspaper. Yep, I saw the newspaper. I got the flyer, but it's, it's, just, on, every, it's on every single board. Okay. Website. Great. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else have a question? Concern? Yes. So real quick, I'm, oh, sorry, that's my teacher voice. Um, I'm gonna, I just wanna kind of address your last question, um, but not as a board member, more as a parent at Big Tree Elementary. Um, they don't have an electronic sign, and I've been fighting for that. It's safety. Um, they need it there. Even though they share the campus with the high school, that's not what that sign is for. So for me, I want to push for that for the safety of the children there. If there's an emergency, um, just like at Cloverbank, they can hit a button, and it's and it's additional um, letting letting them know that there's something going on there. So, yes, it's good to say there's a concert coming up or, you know, welcome back, school has started. Um, I think we need to look at the safety aspect of it. I, that's all I wanted to say, just because that's really important to me at Big Tree with students there.
We really appreciate everyone coming out. And I'm really impressed with the product that we are producing here at Frontier. Both of you eloquent, very good. Like the input. Um, anything for the good of the order? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, please tell anyone we're gonna be at the high school on Thursday night, seven o'clock. And if there's any questions at all, please generate them through the website. We'll answer them.